Thanks everyone for coming to the Arbet, uh, Edmonton R user group March 2022 um, event. And I'm Peter Salamos, organizer of the YEG uh, meetup group. And I'm going to be talking about how to vectorize and parallelize your R code using apply and related functions from BASAR and some other packages. So thanks for all the small crowd who get it today. Here's my slideshow that I put together for tonight. We are a small but very enthusiastic group of people who organize these live speaking events right now online. And uh, we look at topics from data wrangling visualization and down the road, maybe we'll, we'll talk about Shiny. So everyone is welcome, whether you know or, or just going to delve into this. And we are in Edmonton, which is located on Treaty 6 territory, traditional gathering place for diverse indigenous peoples, including Cray, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, and many other peoples whose territories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our community. Our sponsors are the R Consortium and uh, Analytium Solutions. And uh, I think we are just fine with these going online. And uh, hopefully uh, in a couple of months, uh, we might uh, start meeting in person, which would be really awesome. I know places are opening up and I think now at the university and, and in downtown Edmonton, there are uh, less restrictions for these types of gatherings. So it's just a matter of finding a place where we can meet and uh, maybe then have real pizza and other beverages. There aren't a lot of us, so why don't we go around and just introduce ourselves quickly and what is that last thing that you did with R? So I go first, I was uh, working on a plumber API and trying to bring down some compute times below a certain limit, which turned out to be not a very easy task. So we need to find all kinds of creative solutions. So that, that was my fun for today. Ronnie, how about you? <laughs> Hi, I'm Ronnie. Um... Today, what I was doing, uh, it was deploying a model into a server for production for a business. So it was kind of funny to plug the model into a shiny application also. <laughs> yeah, but that was what I did. Cool, thank you. Fiona. Hello. Um... Well, you got me. I haven't been doing very much in R lately. I guess the latest thing was I um, trying to figuring out uh, how to use the um, R bridge to um, Arc Pro, um, and um, I watched some videos on it and I tried it out. But then I decided it wasn't uh, what I needed for what I was trying to do. So I, that was it. <laughs> well, thank you, Derek. Well. Um... The day started with two emails in my inbox as I got up from uh, Brian Ripley in Oxford about two packages that needed love. So um, I took care of that in the morning. One of them is still sitting in the incoming queue and the other one uh, still needs a bit more work. And other than that, my day job involves linking R to a large um, universal, as we call it, database backend for multidimensional arrays called TileDB which is pretty uh, uh, successful in bioinformatics, genomics, and, and spatial analysis and other things. And I just worked a bit around the package. So I was just setting something up around continuous integration and GitHub Actions and what have you when dinner rang. And otherwise, of course, this is a huge day and the timing is perfect because I'm in Chicago Central Time. We'll stop at nine o'clock. And that's when the TV turns on because the US team is in... Uh, um, 
is in Mexico, and I think Canada plays Costa Rica. Canada, of course, is delivering a masterclass in soccer this qualifying round, so it'll be an important uh, evening. I heard that Italy failed to qualify, which is spectacular because it's the second World Cup in a row, and in between they became European champions. So you just see how tight it is over there. So uh, that's, that's it. Good times. Oh, you mean like Canada qualified and Italy didn't? Yeah, Canada is awesome right now. When I still lived in Canada, it was pathetic. And the, you know, the FIFA has a ranking like the ELO style. And I think the men's team was sort of 90th on a good day. And the women, of course, were champions. So I, I saw the women a few times at World Cups. Uh, um, um, but yeah, no, Canada, Canada is good. They have a very dynamic um, young team. And they were very smart and coached the coach of the women's team and made him the coach of the men's team. So that doesn't happen all that often uh, either. So that's a good time. That's a Brit, so he's important. All right, thanks very much. So moving ahead, I'm going to talk about the step-by-step -step guide for parallelizing your R code. And at the beginning, we are just going to use a loop as uh, I've seen most people do. And we kind of stay at that level because it works. And I'm just going to highlight what if you make some very minor modifications to uh, delineate some blocks. Hello, Lionel, you just missed introductions, but not too much. So please go ahead and introduce yourself. This is a really small team now. Hi there, uh, I'm Lionel Leston. I am a former postdoc of Peter's previous uh, supervisor, Aaron Bain at the University of, Mant University of Alberta Department of Biological Sciences. I work with uh, models of boreal birds species and communities looking at the effects of uh, forestry and energy sector development among other things. Thanks. We also have Halder here. Welcome. If you want to say a few words about yourself, just a quick intro. Okay. No problem. So I was just about giving some background about this uh, talk. And so a few words about me. I'm an ecologist and I've been developing, writing R code since 2007. And right now I work at a company called eSource where I work on data for utility companies. And I also have a company on the side called Analytium Solutions. And I used to work at the University of Alberta, Biodiver Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, which is going to say hello again, because I'm going to be using a publicly available, but somewhat cleaned up data set from my previous job to illustrate some of the issues you might run into or kind of a particular set of data, which uh, lends itself to the kinds of approach that I'm going to outline. And so a bit about the motivation. I was working a lot with MCMC using the JAGS, uh, and RGX package. And in 2009, I wrote this package, which is the clone that is a wrapper around JAGS. And uh, we are doing data cloning, which is kind of how to use MCMC to get frequentist answers. And uh, I really liked JAGS because unlike WinBugs, it never crashed. It just maybe didn't start, but then I knew I had something to fix. And what I also liked is that it had this little progress bar. So I knew exactly how long I have until things finish. And then I was writing other packages. So for example, the resource selection and detect packages, which includes some bootstrap and, and other things where, again, you need to run things 100, 200, maybe more times. So I just wanted to have something like a similar experience, but then I, I realized that the state at how this text progress bars and others were in base are kind of a hodgepodge of all over the places. So I thought, hmm, I can just unify this 
in a nice way and add it to uh, apply, l apply functions in that way, because that is what I used in these packages. So then I started adding it to one of the packages, but then I realized, oh, this is going to be useful for my other packages. So I kind of carved it out and called it pb apply. So these apply family of functions uh, prepended with pb that stands for progress bar. So you don't need a lot of modification, just add the two letters in front of the uh, function name and it's going to show a nice progress bar and maybe time estimates how long you have to have a coffee, for example. And uh, then later, the parallel package uh, became part of base and it just wasn't um, like as piecemeal again as before. So for example, we had snow and uh, multi-core packages and now it's all just unified in, in uh, the base distribution as part of parallel. So there is really nothing that would prevent people of uh, gaining more efficiency if you have more than one core, which is more of the norm even a cloud computing has less number of cores usually than your laptop. So why not utilize those? And where I'm coming from with this is also just pre tidyverse So that's why I'm focusing on these functions and less about per and future and those other newer pieces because this was just like at the time what was available and what I was using on a day-to-day -day basis. So this kind of give you a bit of a background. And then this package, this PB apply is uh, my least scientifically informed package of all. So this is just like, give me a progress bar, but this is the most used and downloaded package that I, I wrote so far. And uh, at some point in a few months back, I was above 100,000 downloads, which I know nothing in comparison to RCPP, um, but uh, it is still, a really decent number. And what is really important beyond this like vanity metric of how many times people download it is that other packages depend on it, which means I'm flagged as a heavy reverse dependency when I submit a new version. And then that takes some time to run all the packages with, with this update and see if anything breaks. So far, I haven't had anything like that. And it's almost 200 package uses PB apply to, to display progress bar in, in some ways, which uh, is just like super cool. So what this package does is add the progress bar, nothing less, nothing more, but also it's really easy to just specify an argument for uh, parallel processing, which kind of takes it to uh, a different level. And I like it, um, not just because um, I wrote it, but also this makes for myself package development also very easy because I can just expose this API as part of those functions and I, I don't really need to touch anything. It even works with Shiny. So it kind of recognizes that it's running inside Shiny. And when you run this, then in the Shiny UI, you're going to see the progress bar. So that's pretty neat that was added uh, lately. I also got some testimonials, um, which just further indicates that people like it and uh, they take notice when we add cool new features, which is always good as a, an open source developer to get these kinds of uh, emails or, or feedback on social media. So thank you for these people to saying these nice words. So we'll be using a data. So this is not uh, iris or MT cars, but a, a real data set which is about birds. So the Vitrex um, system is a, a storage space and also a UI for analyzing or kind of transcribing this data, which is collected in the field through recording. So uh, researchers leave out a recording unit kind of uh, screwed onto a tree. It records on preset time intervals and then they listen to the songs and identify the birds. And the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute collected a bunch of data in, in Alberta and I'm using this and I was using this as part of my previous job to look at 
when the birds arrive and uh, whether there are any patterns, um, like they, they just arrive sooner or later, or they are more active in the morning or in the afternoon. With this background, we have like hundreds of species in Alberta, 120 some land bird species that you can uh, spot on these recordings. And uh, what we did is to fit a model for each species. So this is when you have these problems that you need to maybe write a loop because then you iterate over the species and similar ideas might apply when you have a bootstrap. Here's your data set, you resample it 200 times. And these are the things that you usually write a loop or use an apply function, or you might want to write your own functions and then just do things that way. So this is what I'm going to highlight with this data set. So think about it as you have samples and species in a like a data frame or a matrix, and you just want to fit very similar things for each column. And this is how you want to kind of iterate over this data to get a set of results. So now comes the hands-on part and I included a link in the chat. So you don't need to type this from here, but you just click on that. And then if you do that, then you're going to go to GitHub where I put together this uh, little workshop about, uh, I called it the road to progress. So at the end, you'll see the progress bar and you can just get this whole repository, clone it or download the zip file from here and open it up in your uh, computer locally. But to be able to just play with it without any kind of installation, you can also click on this Git pod button. If you have a GitHub account, then you can just authenticate with that. You can see the Ukrainian flag while we are waiting. And then once it logs in, then it sets up an environment where we're going to have the dependencies pre-installed and the code ready to go. So I urge you to do the same, just click on that button and uh, then you have the same environment in front of you and then you can follow along. So there are, while this is loading, other ways of uh, working through the files, uh, which you can all read about in the readme file. So if you can look at the git diffs, you can see how along these nine or 10 steps, the code has been changing. So right now, if you follow the git pod and maybe I just stop there and see if uh, you could follow along or people have trouble accessing it, I hope not. So once you are here, then you can just in the terminal open up R. And then let's begin with step one. Now, if you use command enter or on Windows control enter, as I remember, then you can just send this line to the R console. So this is a VS code, which is a Visual Studio code. Um, that is a really nice integrated development environment that supports R better and better. So it's uh, almost on par with our studio, maybe not in every regard, but for syntax highlighting and just basic things, it is really useful. And if you are doing a lot of work in other uh, languages that maybe our studio isn't supporting that much, then you don't need to switch uh, back and forth. And uh, so right now we are using it because it's much easier to set up in Git Gitpod. So you can see on the left, here are the files and we are going to go through the steps. So when I open up step two, then you will see a couple of more lines added, which I'm going to explain. But right now we just load this example data and what's inside
of x and y. So let's see what is this. So x is going to be a data frame where we have um, a key for each of these points that were sampled. Then we have visits. So each of these locations were sampled multiple times. And then we have columns like TOY, time of year, time of year C, which is a, a categorical version of that. TOD stands for time of day. TODX, that's again a, a derived version of that. And a categorical, which just says midnight or morning. So this is what we have in X and in Y. You see, it has the same 19,732 rows. So these are kind of matching those uh, sampling events. And we have 287 columns. And if you look at the column names, then you see these bird names appearing. So this is where the bird information is coming in and lots of lots of zeros, which means that given bird at that sampling event was not recorded. But we can do something like this table as numeric y and see that yes, lots of lots of zeros, but we have some um, higher than zero counts, which means how many individuals of that bird species was counted within this uh, one minute segment when, when they listened to the recording. And sometimes for very few birds and occasions, you might even count it six or five, but mostly it was zero, one or two. So this is the data. So just kind of give you a glimpse without printing all of that. This is how it looks. So you have this matched up with X. This is all organized, so we don't need to do any kind of data wrangling. This data is ready to go. So with this uh, quick intro, now we can move on to step two, where we start doing some analysis with this. So we have a package called MGCV, which implements a generalized additive model or GAM, which fits a nonlinear function to uh, the, the data. So the data here is going to be, um, was there a bird detected or not? So this is what we're just making a copy of X, pick a species, let's say oven bird, because that's a quite common species. So we are not going to have an issue fitting with this model. And so this is how you would usually approach uh, this. You probably pre-process the data, saved it, and now you are just loading it in and start writing and, and dive into how you want to analyze this. So let's pick a species. So then once you create this copy of the data, then you might create your response, which is going to be called Y. And we are just taking this column from the Y, big Y matrix, SPP. And I created this uh, index for that. So if you change this to another bird species, let's say here we had American crow, for example. So if I copy this name over here, then now I can fit a model to the next species. And this is going to be really important down the road. Right now we are just making an if else statement. If the count is greater than zero, code it as one. If it's zero, leave it as zero. So this is going to be our binomial response for the GAM model. And we added this column to this copy of X. Now I'm skipping through this, um, really explaining what is being done here, but what I'm trying to do in this model is I'm selecting the sites where over multiple times, the species was detected at least once. And this information gives us the idea, oh, the species was there. So when we find a zero, that means the species is there, but we are not detecting it, right? So that's kind of a, a false 
positive or sorry negative in, in that sense so the species is there but for some reason it is not singing so we cannot hear it on the recording and this is how i was trying to analyze the seasonal pattern of how they change their behavior sing more often which means we are going to see a lot more ones instead of zeros so this is really sparse data and this kind of um, filtering allows us to throw out those sites where the species was never recorded because it's a um, forest species. And if you sample on the prairies, you're not going to find it. So you want to, I'll talk about their behavior and not really their spatial distribution. So that's why we do these few uh, steps here to identify which locations they can be found. And then based on that uh, key, we can take a subset where it occurred. So you see now we say, we want just the morning stuff where the species occurred. So this is our data set that goes into the gam. We fit Y as the function of a spline for time of year, and we use a binomial family. So we are going to estimate what is the probability of the species being active given that it leaves at that site. And this is going to be um, against time of year. So from March to August, what kind of pattern can we see for Ovenberg? So let me run these lines and you can do the same. Some data processing, fitting the model. There we go. Now, if I print out, I don't see much. There's a spline degrees of freedom. And if you want to plot in, in this Gitpod and VS Code environment, you can say plot M and it created a PDF, which shows nothing because the graphic device is still open. So see corrupted PDF. So what you can do is call dev.off, which is going to close that connection. And now you can see the plot. So this is a bit clunky, but that's the price we have to pay for being able to just click on it and, and are it running in our browser. If you know a nice survey around this, I'm happy to hear, but for now, this is how we are going to view the plots. You can see as time goes by, and this is the day of the year around 100, which is, I believe, April, it starts to increase. And here around 120, like mid-May, the species is now everywhere pretty much. Um, and uh, you can see this probability then being high till the end of uh, July, August. So this is kind of the biology behind it. Now we can go back to step two and uh, we are almost done. So now what we are doing is uh, we set up this vector that we want to predict for. So this is the range of time of year values that we have in the data set. So we're not really trying to extrapolate here, but we want a nice prediction. And to, to do that, we need to call the predict method on the uh, model object. And we are going to tell, use this new data, which is just going to be this time of year vector sequence from the min to max. And we want to predict on the response scale. So this is going to be zero to one, some kind of probability. And then once we do that, then again, we can plot it and uh, dev off. So this is now our prediction. There we go. So probability increases and then decreases again. And what this tells us is the species becomes less active because it is focusing on raising the kids and not really singing anymore. So now this was one species and now 
the idea might occur that we want to do the same thing for the rest of the species, which takes us to step three. And if you look at the GitHub version, the divs are going to show you exactly which lines are changing. So how we keep adding a couple of lines. So this is now all familiar, but at the beginning, we're just going to take a set of species. So the column names from Y, where some conditions apply. And that means S is uh, the prevalence of the species. So we don't really want to now focus on the very rare ones. So we're just going to use the ones where we have at least 100 detections. That is still going to give us plenty of species. So maybe I just clean up my global environment and start from here again. So this capital SPP have 71 species. These are the relatively common ones. So now what we do here, again, the same vector, TOY from 70 to 209. And based on that, we create a matrix. This is a placeholder where we are going to store the predictions. So we have as many rows as the length of this TOY vector here. And then the number of columns is going to be matching the number of species. So we can then create the predictions for every species, which is just going to be a nice way to visualize all those wiggly lines at the end. So this is where we are going to put the predictions in. And then here again, we can pick a species, but we can also just loop over the species. So small SPP is going to be one from capital SPP. And then I just added this curly brace here, but otherwise this block is the same as what we had in step two. So you need to find a dimension of your data that you're going to um, iterate over. This is species here, but it can be something else. And then the rest, if you did that important thing at the beginning so that you call the species as SPP and you weren't really writing oven bird everywhere where you have SPP popping up, then this is now really easy to replace that value. And now we are just referring to the next column. So we can run this whole thing. So it is going to fit the same model um, to the data, but now Y is going to be every time a different species. And then when we predict, we still have this small P and then capital P is where we are going to insert it as a certain column because we gave the column names as a, the species name vector. So that is the column we are going to put the values from P in so that we can uh, plot them just using matplot. So let me run this. And uh, there is also this cat here, which just prints out the species name and how many more we have left so that we see what is going on. So this is kind of a, a way of showing progress. If you are going through a loop, it is usually a good idea to include cat or message. And then sometimes you need to flush the console because otherwise you might not see these popping up that often. And now it's done. So now we have this uh, capital P matrix with all these predictions inside. So what we can do is create another plot where we have X as uh, this vector of time of year values and P as this matrix. Dev off. So here, each line has a fitted, a predicted value based on a model. You can see 
more lines are kind of here, which means they tend to be active in the breeding season. That's why you can hear the birds. There are some really wonky ones, which would probably need some looking into what is going on. Why do we get that? Does it make sense? But that's not the point for today. And so this is how usually people develop loops and then loops inside loops. And then they just end up with a code that becomes hard to maintain uh, over time. Because if you tweak things here and there, then you really need to follow that through and then running the whole thing again to see and spot errors. So instead of that, I tend to kind of break it up into smaller chunks. So run the modeling first, then look at those, then take the model objects and run the predictions, which is one of the exercises that if we would have time, then uh, we might go with that. So right now, let's just be happy that now we have a loop. And so we don't have to kind of copy the code and just call another species and just have the same block repeated 71 times, which would be really not desirable. But luckily R has loops and I know people tend to not like loops because that's what they hear. But I think loops are still awesome because this is how you begin developing some code that you can then abstract away more. So now if we go to step four, what we see here is uh, very much the same, but on line 14, a very important thing happens. So line 14 here was the loop. So what we have instead of the loop is we define a function, which we call just fun as a reference to that it's a function. You can call it really anything. Um, which might be more meaningful. So if you have a bunch of functions, then you know which is which just by the names. And so it begins here and it ends here. So for each species, that is an argument that this function takes. Once you specify that argument, that is just going to look up the data from the global environment, which you might want to change later so that we pass it also as an argument. But right now, this is all fine. We just wanted to demonstrate that going from a loop to a function is really as straightforward as changing one line. And then at the end, maybe make the return value of that function explicit. So whatever happens inside this bag, what you create inside the bag is going to stay inside the bag unless you return it at the end. So that's why you can just type P here so that you want to return P, or you can be more explicit and say return P. So let's um, remove things again, list equals LS. And uh, just in the meantime, anyone has any questions so far? Feel free to interject and I'll, I'll stop and explain and slow down. Just let me know. So once again, start here, define our species of interest, set up the placeholder for the predictions and define this function. So nothing really happened. We just defined the function called fun which is just the same as what we uh, sent to the console. And now, instead of doing this, everything inside the loop, now this is reduced. So we again loop over the species vector. We print out the same info, what is being done. But instead of all that um, thing copied inside the loop, now we only have call this function on the species name and whatever that function returns, put it into the P matrix. So this was at the very end of the previous step. We made a prediction and then stored that vector as part of this matrix. Now this P is returned by the function. And really that's the only change we make. At the top, we kind of wrapped everything up to returning P into the function. 
And now we are just calling that function and storing the results. Let's see. Now we have this running and <clears throat> soon we'll have the exact same graph as before, or at least I hope that's going to be the same because if not, that means we did something wrong. So it's almost done. And what I've seen when looking at people's code, this is kind of uh, the, the biggest hurdle that they have to overcome if they want to move beyond how to then maybe vectorize or parallelize the code more efficiently is to identify these parts that you can put into a function and how to then do that. And so the, one of the main points of this workshop is really to, to highlight that if you think it through and already have a loop, then it's just a really small modification and maybe just a bit of understanding of how functions work so that you can go to the next level and use your own functions. Now we have the P again filled with values and we can plot it. So this is now the new plot dev of Yes, very similar. So we did the same thing again, which is exactly the point. So there are many different ways of how you can achieve the same result. And uh, there is a certain progression towards better quality code and just less headache if you follow some of these principles and, and use functions because it becomes easier to kind of troubleshoot uh, where things went wrong and it's modular so you can extend it uh, in a much more easier fashion. So after step four comes step five. Let's see what kind of differences we have there. The beginning is very similar, but on line 35, we do something um, quite interesting. So if I go back to step four, just to make sure that what I'm saying is true, line 33, nothing has changed up to this point. So we don't need to review that again, <clears throat> unless you want me to go over some points. But if not, then I'm just going to maybe go a bit back and forth between these two steps. So here, we still used a loop and within the loop, we call the function. Now this is the step where we took a for loop, created a function and called that function as part of a kind of a fewer line for loop. What we do here is replacing that second for loop with another function which call l apply. <clears throat> So what the name stands for, and of course you can look up the help pages, is that we have these apply functions which, which themselves take an input, which can be a vector or a matrix or something matrix-like or even higher dimensional. And then for each rows or columns, you can apply a function. So just imagine that what we did before is we had a matrix where we did something with each column. So apply is going to do the same. Here's my input, do something with every column. And then at the end, give me the results in some way. So what L apply does, L stands for list. So the result is going to be a list. And this is the most basic of these apply functions. So if you provide this vector of species names and call this fun function, that function, again, remember, it takes a single argument, the species name. We have the species names in this vector. So this was the vector that we used to loop over. So now implicitly what we are saying, use the first value of this capital S PP as the first argument of this function and give me the result. Once this is done, then go to the second element of the test PP. 
the third, the fourth, and the last. So this is really a shorthand for running a loop. And then at the end, we are not going to get the results as a nice matrix as we did before, but we are going to get it as a list. So while I'm talking, maybe let me just clean up again. Run these lines fresh so that you can see I'm not doing anything um, funny. And now this L apply is running. We have no way of knowing how much longer it's going to take. Previously in the loop, we were smart enough to include some kind of printout of which species is actually being uh, modeled. Now we just have to wait. We don't know how long. It might be half a minute, two hours. Well, usually you have some idea, but not a very precise idea of how long it's going to take. Now it's done because this is not like a super long process. And so this P list is going to be a list that have 71 elements. So maybe let me just show you the structure of P list, the first three. So this is how the rest of the list looks like. Each element is a vector of length 140. So this is the number of days we want to predict for, and then some values, tiny, tiny numbers at the beginning, because this is where the probabilities are small and later it kind of goes up and down. So we have a vector for every species. So what we can do to cast it into a matrix is to use this do.call function, which is telling us like, call a function on this list. And we call the cbind function, which is going to take each of these vectors and bind them together as columns. And the output is going to be uh, a matrix that we've seen before. So if I run this, now we have a P, which is a matrix with uh, 140 rows and 71 columns exactly what we had before, except we don't have column names. So we can remedy that. Call names P is a SPP. And we don't have the column names because our SPP vector didn't have names. So if you give a name of this vector, then the output is going to have a name and then do call is going to produce column names as well. So this is a small inconvenience that uh, you might run into using LApply, but there are also other functions which take care of this. So this was the next step and I'm not going to run matplot again. You can guess it just produces the same image as before. So let's see what awaits at step six. Same thing, the function is defined, it returns P. Now we see a similar but somewhat different function and we don't have do.call. So what the S stands for, before step five, we had L apply, which gave us a list. S here stands for simplify. What that means is we are going to get the results as columns, as long as their length matches. So if you have unequal length returned by the function, then it is going to stay a list. But right now it's guaranteed that every vector is going to have exactly uh, 140 values in them. So remove and run it again. So now the same thing happens, we just need to wait a little bit. And by just kind of having a feel for these kinds of functions, you also see that this is not really faster than a for loop. 
at least not in this uh, instance. So that is not always true that the, a loop is uh, inferior compared to these vectorized functions. You can simplify your code to a large extent by, by vectorizing it, but you might not necessarily get a, a speed improvement. So now we have this P again. And if you look at the structure, we see now you instantly get the column names. No further uh, manipulation is required and you can then plot it. So this is what we were after. We wanted to get this. So now we are at a point where we can write a function, expose some of those arguments, and then instead of a loop, we can now call these vectorized functions to kind of get a nice and uh, simplified way of returning these, these results. Let's move on to step seven. Immediately, we see a change at the first line. Remove list ls. So this just makes sure we don't have anything in the global environment, except for packages that we loaded, but we didn't really load anything. Just refer to gam using uh, mgc with namespace. But now we are going to load this pbapply library. The rest of the code is the same up to line 35. So if I go back and maybe I just close a couple of these. So step six, we had s apply spp comma one. Now we have pp s apply spp comma one. So really we loaded a, uh, a package and prepended two letters. Let's see what that gives us. There's a time estimate and a little progress bar is crawling along the screen. So now we know how long we need to wait until we get the results. 15 more seconds, not a long time, but you might see two hours here. And that way you would know, hmm, maybe I need to open up another um, terminal and uh, R process to, to do something else while this is a uh, finishing or just watch a YouTube video or, or go out for a run or a coffee. So now it's done, but otherwise things are all the same. We get the same matrix, the same values. So this was a really minimal change that we had to do to be able to see the progress bar, which uh, people like, or at least very used to, because this is what you see every time in your browser, on your phone, you have either a bar or some kind of spinner that is telling you, hang on, you're going to get the results pretty soon. So this was step seven, very easy modification. And I think this is where uh, the fun begins. Now we are not just, yes, we can write a function and we can use vectorized code, but we can also add the progress bar, which is like, not a big deal on its own, but very convenient. So now we want to parallelize it so that we can exploit the multiple CPUs on our laptops. And uh, in Gitpod, this is not going to translate to huge time savings because we have limited resources under this free plan. And the Gitpod's uh, point is not really to make your compute intensive job easier or quicker. That is more for kind of a either teaching, demoing, or just quickly checking out changes in the real context when you are developing code and you want to share it to, with people. They don't have to spend like half an hour setting up the same environment or, or wait for um, whatever build process to finish first. So I just stop here for a minute and open up for any questions before we jump into the parallel processing. So maybe what I would be interested to hear if uh, this pattern that I outlined here is a, a common paradigm to kind of start developing code line by line and then try to wrap it up. So is this something that you, you are doing or, or you have something maybe a totally different approach? I'd love to hear some of your experiences with this.
Go ahead. Lionel raised a hand, but I can't hear you. Okay, well, uh, <clears throat> you, you already know that I'm uh, using uh, code like this uh, for uh, running bird models based on scripts uh, adapted from ones you developed. So in the next little while, what I'm going to be trying to do is uh, get uh, I'm kind of wondering how much exposition is worth uh, mentioning here. Uh, so Peter developed some regional bird models for Alberta, and he stored the model coefficients in a package he developed several years ago called Cure for Insect, which is a way of extracting these model coefficients in R. More recently, he worked on a refined a sort of refined package that does the same job of storing model coefficients uh, called all-in-one. So now I'm adapting the R scripts I previously used to use to extract model coefficients uh, from his old package to get model coefficients from his new package. But uh, Right now, the scripts, uh, what I'm able to do is I'm able to get model coefficients for each of multiple bootstrap sample data sets uh, for each species. And what I want to do is I want to summarize these predicted densities for each species from all of these sample data sets that Peter had, well, Peter and his uh, replacement at the ABMI uh, LE Knight uh, ran. So it takes a long time to get these. So th I'm interested in uh, using parallel processing to speed up the, speed it up. Well, that's coming next. So you're at the right spot now to learn about that and see how a small modification might take you there. So I think, um, this might be then beneficial. Anyone, anyone else wants to chime in at this point or should I just go ahead and make sure that you're not missing the, the game tonight? Okay. So, so now we have, again, nothing in our uh, workspace. And we are on step eight. At the very beginning, we have the same PB apply package loaded. And then next to that, we have parallel, which is the uh, most widely used package for parallel computing in R that unifies previously separate packages for SNOW, which stands for I can't remember, but it's kind of those uh, clusters uh, when you can specify either a cluster of workers on your machine, which usually is a multiple CPUs, or you can have a more heterogeneous, like just uh, different PCs or cloud instance patched together as a cluster. Go ahead. Simple network of workstations. There you go. And it's a word play on something because they, they mimic the idea from something else. I think there was something like cow cluster of workstations, but I forgot mm -hmm. what language that was in. And yeah, that's where it came from. Yeah. Simple network of workstations. So I remember at some point I was running from one corner to the other of, of the office where I had multiple computers and each of those were running a couple of our processes. And at the end, I was kind of collecting these via a USB drive. And then I had all these results all in one place. So really this cluster is, is very similar except for you don't really have to run around and, and collect the data yourselves, but just each computer is doing its job. And then they communicate with each other so that the master node, or I think the, the main process is then collecting the data from these worker nodes. And at the end, you just expect to have the same result as we've seen before, but now the results are coming from uh, processes 
on different CPUs or different machines. So how you define that, I'm not going to really talk about it, how to like really use a cloud instance uh, to be able to plug into, but also, um, so on your laptop, you can get a huge speed up just by doing this. And also there is another way of parallelizing things, which is not working on Windows, although you might have uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux, which uh, I think provides this forking type of parallelism, which was originally coming from this um, multi-core package. So if you have used these, then you, you might be familiar with MCL apply. So again, an apply function, but MC stands for multi-core. And the nice thing about that is uh, we are going to see some error messages. So I'll stop, stop right there and we'll just see where multi-core is going to shine compared to these uh, simple uh, cluster um, networks. So once we load parallel and load the data, the rest is the same. Specify our objects and the function. So now on line 37, the difference is PBS apply, two arguments, SPP and fun. Now we see a third one, CL, which stands for cluster. And we can say, I want four processes. So now it is just going to somehow miraculously run things in parallel. And as I said, in Gitpod, you might, you might not see a huge improvement because uh, resources are pretty constrained there. So it's not going to be too much different from running it in a sequential mode. But on your own laptop, if you try this, you're going to see um, not necessarily a linear speed up, like one quarter of the time as you had before, but uh, something similar. So if it took one minute before, it might only take um, 15 seconds or somewhat more because you still need to leave room for this uh, kind of scheduling aspect of the work so that each worker gets the part of the job that they are supposed to deliver at the end. And at the end, you still need to organize it into um, the same list so that you are not kind of um, garbling it up so that the ordering of the results stays the same. So you need to kind of check which job goes where and then when it finishes, how you assemble this output. And by doing this, we also get a progress bar, which as it turns out, not a straightforward thing to do, but it's not impossible. So what we do is we do small chunks and update the progress bar in between, which is not really impacting the performance too much, but there is a slight overhead there as well. But for everyday life, it's not really significant. So this is the most straightforward way of adding or running things in parallel, like four workers. Um, although I think a lot of people use Windows for their, their day job. And if you say anything, like just a number as the CL argument, it is not going to do anything. It is going to still assume you only have one of these cores and there is no going to be any warnings or, or gain. So if you are working on Windows, you need to do something more. And this is where really this CL comes in because that refers to not multiple cores, but the cluster that you want to run the job over. And that takes us step 9A. Now I'm not cleaning up my environment because we are going to do something slightly different. So maybe I'll just remove P. So this is what we need to do. We're just going to create a cluster with four workers. And instead of telling PBS apply that CL equals four, we have this cluster object. 
So if you print it out, it says socket cluster with four nodes on host local host. So this implies it can be on a not local host as well. So if you have a server with lots of lots of compute capacity and uh, you can connect to it, there are various protocols that would allow you to do that. Usually you use something like MPI, message passing interface. I think that's what it stands for. And uh, that is one of the most commonly available ones on these big cloud computing machines. And then you can tap into those resources. So I'm not going to talk more about how to define this cluster, but there are various ways of how you can set it up. At the end, you get this cluster object, which is going to tell our how to communicate with these worker nodes so that you get the job done. Now, the next thing is just, as I said, instead of CL equals four, we use this cluster object. Now, use this cluster to run the job on it. Hmm. Four nodes produced errors. First error, object X not found. So this is telling us that these worker nodes don't have everything that they need. Because remember, within these functions, so we didn't pass X into the function. That was just out there in the global environment and the fu function had access to it. Now what happens inside the cluster, it's a brand new process. There's nothing in it unless we put something in it. And the only thing we have is uh, this value that is going to be the argument of the function and the function that we want to run on this worker node. So we need to do something more. And this is where kind of working with these and uh, being on Windows needs a bit more extra work, but I think it is not a significant hurdle. And that's why we have step 9B because that's where we are going to cover what we have to do. And it might look a bit scary, but it is not. Hopefully once I explain what is happening here, this is just, if the error says there is no X, what we do is we specify X, Y, and everything that we need for these workers to have access to, and then the function is going to work. So there are two very important and very useful functions. Once we specify the cluster, which we just stubbed, it is still there, but it is not active. So we just recreate it again. So these are again defined in the parallel package. So we have one cluster eval queue, which evaluates an expression on our cluster. So if I run this line, we're going to see lots of output, which you can um, kind of capture in a temporary variable if you don't want this to pollute your logs or screen, but I just left it here because I wanted you to see that this is the result that comes back. For one, two, three nodes, these are the packages that are loaded. And now, because we said library MGCV, that is also loaded. So these are the packages that we have available there. And on each node, now we just loaded MGCV so that the GAM function will work, although we are referring to that by the namespace. So we don't really have uh, an issue there, but I just included this because this is a really handy way of run some um, expressions, like I said, the working directory, load certain packages. So whatever you put here, that is going to happen on every node. Now the next line is cluster export. Again, we specify which cluster we're talking about and uh, either put the objects there or refer uh, to them by name. So we need X and Y and also this um, TOY, the vector, because this is what we are using to create that new, new data that we are predicting for. So if you, for example, oh, let me do that. So if I just say cluster export, 
x and now say cluster evolve q ls give me the objects from that environment you see now we have x there so what happens if i want to run this on the cluster now we need y and so on so if you keep adding these eventually you'll run out of the missing pieces so if i now add y but not toy i'm going to get another error so let's just send everything over and now we can wait for the results to come back so in the meantime let's just maybe talk about what happens when these 71 individual individual jobs finish not uh, within the same amount of time so what happens when the processing time is unequal well the progress bar is still going to move but the time estimate might be off so in that case if you know that is going to be happening either um, compute time is going to vary by random in which case it's a good pointer but if for example you put things in order and things are either decreasing in compute time or, or increasing as you go through this sequence then the timing might be very off and you have some of these examples when this is the case for example in data cloning we increase the number of clones and it just linearly takes more and more time in which case this doesn't really make a lot of sense to do this at least to get the time estimate so there might be cases when this program bar, bar or at least the time estimate is not very useful but those are relatively uh, rare because you have some control over that and that is the end so if I go back to the readme file, which is either on GitHub or I just scroll down here, at the very end, if you feel like it, so right now, what time is it? 7.16, so I would stop here, but I just wanted to finish off with, so here's an exercise. Right now, we did two things in that function, fit the model, make a prediction. So if I were delivering this in person and we would have like maybe four hours, then we would uh, have um, a break and then we would come back and tweak it a bit more so that we, instead of one function, we have two functions, maybe a bit more arguments, then just kind of go to a couple of those uh, lessons uh, why that's a good idea to maybe pass X and Y and TOY as arguments and so on and then how to write multiple functions and then just do more of these progress bar um, enhanced uh, runs of uh, apply functions and uh, if this would not be enough for someone then there's a lot more that you can explore when you want to maybe run things but don't necessarily want that process like right now while p is running um, we can't really do anything else in this R um, console. So if you use promises or the future API, then you can kind of wait for those uh, promises to resolve. So you're not blocking the main process. It's happening somewhere. And you can kind of check in. Has it been resolved? Once it's resolved, then you just pull in the values and, and work from there. So if you only have a single process, which if you have RStudio server running on a cloud instance, maybe that's what you have access to. So in that regard, it's, it's really handy, but that's a bit more involved to talk about those. But here's the link. Then also we haven't talked about random numbers, which are really important. You don't really want the same random numbers on these processes. So, so there are ways to kind of uh, get around that issue, although it needs some some thinking about especially if you're running bootstrap which relies on random numbers take a random subset of the data with replacement then you really need to uh, make sure that random numbers are going to be independent and uh, you're not going to get the same um, values from everywhere then there is also another approach which kind of uh, 
a mix of um, these functions and loops, which is called for each. So for each element of something, do a kind of a function like evaluation of a closure within that. And there is also per, which I think adds progress bar two, which is a kind of a, this uh, tutorial by Jenny Bryant gives you a kind of nice side-by-side -side comparison of, of all these different paradigms and how one one to use per um, and uh, kind of compare that to other approaches. So these uh, links are here for your reference and uh, I'll stop right here and uh, open up for questions, discussions. Yeah, I'm like you there that I use the old ones out of parallel as well, but I guess all the online excitement by the people who get so excited is then marrying future and per and calling it fur, but because I don't use fur, but still the old apply functions, I mean, I'm content with what's there, but um, that was really well done and really well paced. Um, Thanks. Did you learn something new? Well, you know, I gave similar tutorials, including mm -hmm. use us and all the rest of it when I was more active with HPC. It's just, I, I learned how to pace well. I tend to, yeah. <laughs> I, I also start at the other end and start with the, you know, evolve functions to load mm -hmm. the other material into the nodes and all the rest of it. So it was, was good. Um, yeah. You didn't say, you didn't tell us any tricks. I mean, where you, how the callback works. I mean, how you pick up the information that, that the, progress bar actually evaluates and how it linearly, you know, extrapolates and when it's exact, or not yes. exact and sort of all that nitty gritty stuff. Yeah, and that was actually quite interesting because I have a co-author on the package who contributed that part of the code, but then kind of took it from there because I just had like a progress bar, pretty boring. It just goes from zero to 100. And he was like, oh, what about we, we add this? And we also have a little spinner, which is now you have a, a uh, package called progress by Gabo Chardi and uh, that is being used um, in all kinds of other packages. And and what I also what kind of like, and I think I'm in the right crowd now with the tinyverse and everything. So this, this PB apply has no dependencies other than what comes with base. And I just really love that feature. Thanks, Peter. Great talk. I have to head out now. Yep. No worries. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. Hello there. Nice meeting everyone. Good night. Thank you. This was very helpful to me because I, it's more of a beginner. I hadn't, um, I guess I had, I have used the, the for, for loop in R, but I, and the functions separately, I didn't put them together that way. And I, now I understand what all these um, applies are for, so thank you. Yeah, and I just kind of thought that I did this many times and it just, there was the same pattern that I start with an empty, like a text editor and I start editing code, load in the data, take a piece of it, do something with it. And once that's developed, then I kind of look at it, how I can chop it up so that I can just put everything in a file and then my 400 lines of code reduces to six. And then of course comes a lot of complexities that we haven't talked about, how to recover when you have an error, how to, especially if you are running something in the cloud and you have no control over what is happening there, how to pick it up, how to use some of these schedulers. So there's a lot more to say, but it's just kind of an introduction. If you wrap your head around how do I write a function? Once I know L apply, then I can pretty much do everything in parallel. I think that's that's a really important skill. There's a lot of nonsense out there with the for loop stuff still. Back, you know, back be, almost before we had R, when R was really young and S was still governing, it used to have a lowercase f4 and an uppercase f4. And then they really had uh, speed differences. And the fours were implemented in terms of the applies and all of, all of that doesn't matter anymore. For R now, four is essentially the same speed as an S apply. And sort of some of this 
really somewhat sort of off-putting and arrogant. Oh, why are you writing loops? Everything has to be functional. It's, it's, just, it's just wrong. I mean, we sit down at the computer to solve a program, to solve a problem, to load a data set, to do some analysis. And thinking in terms of a loop is often the most natural one. And as Peter has shown, once you've expressed it in a loop, because it's so natural to think about it, then you can just change the structure that governs your loop instead of the for statement, you make it one of the apply statements and look, you can even get parallel execution out of that actually relatively cheaply. And that's, that to me is really, is really key. There's, there's no point in obsessing over, oh, is it loops, is it functional or not? They, they both work. I mean, we're, we're, we're just here to analyze data and solve, solve problems. So it's just, you know, just, just less, I don't know, less religious about the how. Uh, loops work. Most people tend to think that way. And then I teach it that way too, and go from loops to the applies. And once we have those, it's easier to go to the parallel stuff, simply, you know, on a laptop, multiple cores. Actually, speaking of which, do you know of anything, Peter, where we can demo easily with multiple machines? Google Collab or any one of those? I haven't really explored, but I have a, a course coming up where I will need that. So yeah, I might have. Idea. So we. Yeah, right. It's I, I used to teach a bit with our studio cloud and we had a campus agreement with them. And that's really it's really not bad, but it's very similar to what you've mm -hmm. shown here. And ours was a three year pilot project and that no longer runs. And now it's just the same. We have the normal our studio cloud, which is similar. Mm -hmm. We have machines there, you can run some shell commands, but this Git integration is also quite nice. And there was always a bit of a setup between our Studio Cloud and GitHub and all the rest of it. So the Git pod isn't, isn't bad. Now, I guess I misunderstood that at the beginning that I thought Git pod also allows you to have small clusters of machines, but no, you just have two or I think it gives you course. some, some so like, I think there are differences in like how big of a resource chunk you get so for the paid one, I think it comes with like, but that may be just that it's a better experience in terms of things yeah, running totally. more smoothly. Often it's just more RAM and yeah, yeah. And more cores, but yeah. But the point, so if you look at where this Git pod takes you, so this link is, well, it resolved to something else, but basically you take a GitHub URL and, uh, if you have a different branch or you want to check out a tag or, or any kind of PR, it is just going to load that state of the repository. So that's the beauty of it. If you want to just see how that works, then you don't need to like do it on your local machine, just send the link to someone and hey, yeah, and you can, can you have a look? Pre-configured -pre with Docker is pretty nice if you like Docker and work with Docker anyway, and then you can just marry, and marry them that way. That's, that's pretty promising. I'll play with that, I think. Hi, Peter. Uh, thank you for the talk. I have a question about the common cluster export. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain a little bit more about it? Uh, I'm most curious about, like, you specify three variables to be accessed by the, the different process, right? How mm -hmm. does this work? In the background, it's like it's not making copy of those variables, right? Probably it's just create some kind of pointers to point to the uh, original ones. No, it actually sends it oh. to those worker processes because this cluster, like right now, if you run it on your laptop, that is going to be like, uh, am I sharing? Probably not correct. Uh, no, no, okay, sorry. Here we go. Yeah, so you can think of your cluster, which is the socket cluster um, on your local host that these processes communicate with each other, but the data actually gets there. So it creates a copy because otherwise if, if this cluster is uh, like not on your desk, but the next room or two towns away or the other part of the globe, you need to send it there. So this is why it's different from the multi-core, which is where the memory is shared. So you don't need to make copies. 
in the same oh, way. Okay. I see. So you can reference the same thing. It's super complicated because there used to be two distinct packages and then one of them got withdrawn and Snow is still there as a package, but the better parts of them were put together and put into this package parallel, which comes with R. And it's underappreciated, but it has a really excellent vignette. It's sort of 15 or 18 pages. And it's a really, really good hands-on introduction to what you have to think about with the parallel computing. I, over the years, always forget what the difference is between what Windows has and doesn't have, because I live on Windows, on, on Linux most of the time. And their parallel is actually is, is pretty nice. And um, yeah, so my default go-to is always MCL apply. And then half the time, I don't remember whether that is available on Windows or not. But in essence, they're all process parallel because this goes back to 15, 20 years when we didn't have multiple core computers or multiple CPU computers and sharing work literally meant taking it from one computer, putting it to another, so really copies. And that's sort of one of the reasons uh, what Peter alluded to that this is super linear because in the coordination of all this parallel work, you have some overhead invariably. So depending on you know, your ratio of overhead to actual work, you'll see how much it, it gains. So for really, yeah, I, I get, you know, you get that on Stack Overflow and other places where people ask questions every now and then that they have something which is computationally trivial, summing a vector, you know, which order does. And then they want to parallelize it and they wonder, well, I have no speed up because there's comparatively speaking, no compute time on the task relative to the overhead. And, and yeah, it, it's those little things, but, oh yes, yeah, right. No, who's maintaining this too. task view? But this is a good starting point for all kinds of things. What kind of packages you get and the different kinds of parallelism and then other high performance stuff. Mm -hmm. yes, okay. And then Thank more you. and more packages just, just like if you're on your laptop and you have more than one CPU like data table or a couple of others, they just default to use four or, or some larger than one um, processes, uh, which is a nice thing that you don't explicitly tell or oh, use two cores or four cores. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so here, and once I looked into this, uh, like a par L apply and how you kind of have a long vector. But here, for example, what happens is that we have 71 jobs mm -hmm. and only four workers. So how that gets split up and what happens when some worker finishes sooner, then can you reallocate? That's another thing that's called load balancing. And there's a function for that called or L apply LD, as I remember. So what happened is 71 divided by four is what? Like almost 20. So you get the first 20, the next 20 on each worker scheduled. And when one takes longer and the other one is done because you only had like three more left at the fourth, then it is just idle. So you can take one of those jobs and put it over there and just need to keep track of which is which so that at the end you get the same ordering of the results. So this can be done, but that's more communication between the workers. So you can probably go um, par L apply LB. Yeah, so these are all on the same help page cluster call apply, apply LB with the load balancing, eval queue export that we have covered. So these are the really core parallel functions that you can find uh, the documentation for. How do I go up and down? Oh, never mind. Yep, but I could get most of the things done with just these four, five commands, really. Create a cluster, load some stuff on it, 
send the data over, run a function, close it down. And what happens in between, you just maybe have to use try or try catch or something like that. So when you get an error, it still goes on and it's not going to just uh, stop in the middle of it. Because usually, or not usually, but in the past, we had to wait for our spot to be scheduled on like Slurm and other big machines. And there's no point in waiting 24 hours to fail after five minutes and then wait another day. So that's why it's, it's a, there are some learnings there, how to create these checkpoints so that you can either recover or pick up where you left and then just not let anything waste. Whatever is calculated, save it. That's kind of the idea. So next, I just wanted to say a few words about what's coming up next month. We are going to have um, a guest speaker, Michael Thomas talking about eCharts, which is a really handy um, JavaScript library to create interactive graphs, similar to Plotly, if you know that probably better. Uh, it comes with really nice animations and visuals. And uh, we are going to see how to create those beautiful graphics straight from R. And uh, Ronnie, who just left, were kind enough to uh, agree to give a talk in May. So we have two more talks lined up and probably something for June. And then we'll have probably a summer break. So that's what I can tell about upcoming events. So you'll um, get some uh, emails about those pretty soon once we kind of finalize some details. Thanks for coming tonight and uh, I'll uh, send some links and pointers and, and the video uh, up to on YouTube and then whoever might want to watch it later, uh, you can do that now. You still have a few minutes left before the game begins. So enjoy the rest of your night and thanks for coming again. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.